the opportunity. It's an honor to be here. My name is Margaret Watkins, and um, I'm the water quality specialist for the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior, Chippewa. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing things I don't really intend to here. Um, if I could have some assistance here for just a moment, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Can you so I'd like to begin with um, the fact that uh, Grand Portage and Fond du Lac staff attended a financial workshop in 2007 that was presented by the U.S. EPA headquarters hard rock mining team. And we thought that it was so valuable. Um, at that time, we had already begun to participate in um, evaluating the PolyMet project as cooperating agencies that Fond du Lac hosted um, a financial assurance workshop for the Minnesota DNR, MPCA, U.S. Forest Service staff, ERM, and PolyMet staff. Uh, to begin thinking about this very critical issue. Uh, and uh, part of the impetus for that was that the state of Minnesota has spent millions of dollars remediating mine sites. And the example that I've given is reserve mining, but also um, the old LTV site where PolyMed is planning to set up its operations uh, left the state without a considerable amount of money. So um, for those of you who don't know, financial assurance is the cost estimation process to assess the funds that are required to perform the tasks of mine cleanup. And these cost estimations aren't based on how much it would cost the company, for example, PolyMet, to clean up the site. They should be based on how much it would cost a government agency to hire a contractor to do the cleanup work. And because um, during bankruptcy, equipment and uh, virtually everything that can be is, is removed, it frequently costs the government um, to hire an outside contractor twice as much as it would a corporation. And so um, considerations for cost estimations, I have them listed. Um, what I'm really here to talk about today is um, long-term operations and maintenance. Uh, but also, I'd like to say up front that um, earthwork, demolition, water management and treatment, things that happen sequentially as a mine is closing also cost a lot of money and it's dependent upon the number of acres of land that are disturbed in part. So uh, both the type of wastewater treatment that's needed to maintain compliance with water quality standards and the number of years that that treatment is needed um, are things that must be included in financial assurance. And when acid mine drainage is likely to occur, um, financial assurance needs to be increased tenfold. And even stormwater attenuation often requires long-term treatment. Um, so that's a consideration that, that isn't often thought about. And also multiple mitigation strategies so that cost estimation would be based on um, different types of pollution prevention to um, avoid groundwater pollution. Um, it requires active wastewater treatment, liners, caps, pumping systems, barriers, um, and particularly in the case of PolyMet, there's been um, a desire to move to passive treatment systems, um, and that's because they're orders of magnitude less expensive than active systems. So the first ever uh, letter of credit required by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and the Minnesota DNR was for Masabi Nugget. Um, it was a $15 million in total letter or letters of credit 
for the mercury filter and mine area cleanup. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough to adequately study the problems, and it wasn't nearly enough uh, for the company to be able to comply with Minnesota water quality standards. And something that we probably have all considered is that companies receive profits from mining, the public at large gets the minerals, we clearly need them, but the Minnesota public and tribes bear a huge environmental and financial risk associated with those projects. And that's why we feel that companies should be required to share meaningfully in long-term financial risk that their projects create. Um, perpetual mechanical treatment will likely be required for all non-ferrous operations in the, that uh, come into being within the state of Minnesota. And so financial assurance for perpetual treatment needs to be part of every project proposal. And as um, just Richards just said, perpetual treatment uh, requires that the principal balance of financial assurance be enough to cover the cost uh, of maintenance and operation using only the interest accrued. And this is in addition to financial assurance that would be set aside for closure and reclamation. Or in other words, those earth moving, uh, revegetating types of activities. And so I'm going to give some quick examples. Um, and this is to sort of put into perspective um, what our concerns are. And um, so the Zortman Landusky mine, that's been uh, mentioned previously as one of the mines that the uh, Minnesota DNR has looked into in terms of financial assurance. Um, and for each of these uh, case examples that I've listed, I list the acres of disturbed land, and that's because that is part of the equation of how much financial assurance would be required. Uh, another part of that equation is how much water is flowing through a site and how much water would need to be treated. So at Zortman Landusky, there was an EIS in the environmental impact statement they predicted that there would be no generation of acid because of the low sulfur content of the ore. That sulfur content was 0.2%. The range for polymet as listed in the supplemental draft EIS is from less than 0 0.12 to 0.6% sulfur. Very quickly, not in hundreds of years, um, in slightly more than a decade, data showed widespread acid generation at Zortman Landusky. Shortly after that, lawsuits were filed by EPA, the Mon Montana DEQ, Fort Belknap Indian Community, and non-governmental organizations. Um, the result of those lawsuits was a 1996 consent decree to build additional wastewater treatment systems for $32 million. In 1998, the reclamation bond that had started eh, around $10 million was increased, and it had been increased over time, but it increased to $70 million, and Pegasus Gold filed for bankruptcy. The uh, reclamation and closure plan that was originally approved would have cost $54 million more than the reclamation bond. The agency preferred reclamation alternative cost $28 million more than the available financial assurance. Um, as of today, there's money set aside for perpetual treatment for that site uh, until 2017, at which time additional funding will have to be set aside by the state to continue uh, to treat the <coughs> water from that site. Summitville, um, another site, uh, uh, a modern mine started up in 1984 with the purchase of 1,200 acres to develop a large-scale open pit mine uh, that disturbed 550 acres. The mining operations ended in 1991 uh, with leaching to extract the last of the metals until March of 1992. 
six months later or so, Galactic Resources filed for bankruptcy. Um, after the bankruptcy proceedings were completed, the site was declared a Superfund site and the public ended up footing the bill for $155 million. Idaho Cobalt Project, another project um, uh, that hasn't gotten off the ground but um, has been permitted, uh, is located in Idaho. It's proposed to be an underground mine where ore would be mined from two separate ore bodies, disturbing only 132 acres. These facilities uh, would include a lined dry stack tailings area and waste rock disposal facility, water management pond, water treatment facilities, and various other facilities. Idaho Cobalt for this project was required to set aside actually a bit more than $44 million in financial <coughs> assurance. The reason that this is not really comparable to Polymet is because, of course, Idaho Cobalt only planned to disturb 132 acres from Polymet's SDEIS. There will be 1,700 acres of disturbed land. Um, the average mining processing rate for Idaho Cobalt, 800 tons per day versus Polymet, 32,000 tons per day. Um, Idaho Cobalt, an underground mine, Polymet open pit, Idaho Cobalt, dry stack tailings, Polymet unlined wet tailings. Um, and these are all things that create additional risk. The dry stack tailings uh, going on a liner and waste rock going on a liner prevent leaching of pollutants into the water. Um, and so it, they're really two very different projects and it's um, understandable then that um, that very low number of 44 million would be required for financial assurance. Um, another comparison is the Flambeau mine in Wisconsin. We often see that compared to Polymet, and it's really not a good comparison. And that's because the uh, percent copper for the Flambeau mine was about 10%. Polymet's is about 0.3%. Uh, the Flambeau mine was only 220 feet deep and 32 acres in size. Polymet's Mine pits are, you know, between six and seven hundred feet deep, nine hundred and twelve acres. So Polymet is proposing a mine ninety times the volume of the Flambeau mine. Uh, the mine life also very different. Flambeau mine four years versus Polymet twenty years. Flambeau mine eight million tons of waste rock versus Polymet three hundred and eight million tons of waste rock. And also at Flambeau Mine, which would be quite different than Polymet, is that there, would, there was no processing of ore at the site, so there were no tailings. The ore was shipped directly off-site. Polymet will be processing ore on-site. Um, so now I'm going to get into examples of copper mining. And um, ASARCO uh, is still uh, uh, operating copper mines, smelters and refineries in the United States. But in 2009, they declared bankruptcy. And their parent companies were also Asarco and Grupo Mexico. As part of that um, bankruptcy settlement and reorganization, Asarco provided $1.7 billion to federal and state agencies for environmental cleanup and restoration. And those, that was for uh, eight sites, I believe. So um, back to the more modern mines. Um, the Phelps Dodge Corporation has a couple of mines in New Mexico, the Chino and Tyrone mines. Um, and they're located in a historic mining district in New Mexico, much like Polymet would be in northeastern Minnesota. They're both large-scale open pit mines. Uh, they started up in the 70s. They're expecting to close around 2020. Um, and their surface, their combined surface disturbance is very similar to Polymet. 
The Chino mine is expected to, to disturb 9,200 acres, Tyrone 6,000 acres. And the financial assurance set aside for surface le reclamation and closure is 228 million for Chino and 278 for Tyrone. Both mines have pro provisions in place to, um, for perpetual water treatment to prevent the formation of pit lakes and to protect, uh, in, and that's in order to protect groundwater and wildlife that might use the pit lakes. Um, and so all of these examples, except for the Flambeau mine, occurred in relatively dry environments. And as uh, Jess Richards pointed out earlier, um, many of the examples we have for mining um, where there's financial assurance are in much drier climates than Minnesota. Much less water um, and still to prevent contamination, keeping pit lakes from forming and um, using dry stack tailings methods are used and that's to prevent long term pollution and the need for cleanup at sites. And so a fundamental difference between PolyMet and these other mines is that it would be located in a wet environment with interconnected surface and groundwater and that creates a lot more risk than many if not all of these other projects. So now I'm going to go back to Masabi Nugget because bar engineering for Masabi Nugget developed uh, cost estimates for treatment and um, for specific types of treatment. And since we're talking about today long-term or perpetual treatment, this was important. Um, so if you can recall in the PolyMet Supplemental Draft EIS, PolyMet suggests that long-term treatment would cost approximately 3.5 to $6 million per year. So they're going to be operating um, a reverse osmosis nanofiltration wastewater treatment system. They also have pumps, liners, um, they have a seepage capture system for the tailings basin, uh, quite a bit more wastewater treatment on site than is estimated here. These are only estimates for very specific types of wastewater treatment. And although the alternative to uh, for in situ biological treatment was the only one that was estimated out for 20 years. Um, I still uh, went through the math, put it out there for you, it's simple math, um, to show that if you double the operation and maintenance of these treatment systems, especially the nanofiltration reverse osmosis system, then PolyMet's estimates, the high end of their estimate at six million dollars per year is 60 percent of Bar Engineering's estimate for Masabi Nugget or six percent. So again, what I've done is a very back of the envelope calculation using Bar Engineering's estimates of treatment costs for Masabi Nugget and, and the purpose again I say of using this is that um, Bar Engineering is a certified engineering firm that does a lot of work for numerous mining companies including Polymet. Um, and so back of the envelope calculation and that's truly all it is using um, fixed interest, no inflation, absolutely nothing else. Um, the fin financial set aside that you would have to have 
to be able to pay for operation and maintenance of these specific types of systems range um, for nanofiltration between 168 million and 336 million dollars. So now I, I move forward with this to um, even though based on uh, Barr's estimates for reverse osmosis nanofiltration operation and maintenance for Masabi Nugget on the same property that Polymet would be located on um, as being far more expensive. Um, I used Polymet's estimates from the SDEIS and again using fixed interest, no inflation, back of the envelope calculation um, and the financial set, set aside um, ranged at the high end from 200 million to 400 million. And so then um, I looked at a more sophisticated or a complex model of financial assurance using an average in interest rate of 7%, average inflation rate of 2%, and with a higher interest rate, the amount of financial assurance required is higher because it includes inflation. And again, using an even more sophisticated model, what we see again is that the financial assurance doesn't go up, it, uh, it goes up, it doesn't go down. So the back of the envelope calculation is strictly a range finder. And that's the message that I'd like to bring to you today, that, that this is a very critical issue. I don't disagree with the Minnesota DNR that it would be very difficult at this time to set in stone the amount of financial assurance that would be required to ensure that wastewater treatment was available for 500 years. Um, but what I do want to demonstrate from this is that this is a huge financial liability for the taxpayers of the state and that I'm really thankful to have this opportunity to speak to you today and that you are considering this, this very important issue. Thank you for your testimony. Are there questions from members? Representative Clark. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Watkins, thank you for your testimony. I'm, I'm um, I'm also looking to you to, you to maybe um, expand a little bit on some of, since you're a water quality um, expert, I believe that was your deal. Uh, some of the questions that have been asked about contamination, where it goes, what we know about it. And I'm wondering if you've looked at that um, and found any, had any different findings than um, what we've gotten from, from PolyMed, you know, having it uh, confined strictly to the Partridge River, uh, especially since you're up there on the... Um, Boundary waters. Could you talk a little bit about that? And if so, I guess the other question is some of the concerns I've least heard from some of our, our tribal communities is the impact on, on our wild rice. So I'm wondering if you would speak to those two issues. Uh, Madam Chair and Committee, yes, um, I have reviewed the um, polymet modeling and not only do we have differences of opinion about flows in the Partridge River and flows in the Embarrass River and um, something called storativity or storage coefficients used in the Embarrass River side, when in 2006, when Grand Portage, Fond du Lac, and Boys Fort were allowed to participate uh, in the review of PolyMet. We recommended that flow data be collected and that additional groundwater 
monitoring wells be installed in the bedrock particularly but also in the surficial aquifer we believe that this is a very data poor project and in fact as part of the uh, cliffs consent decree to clean up the um, existing LTV tailings basin uh, water discharges and area pit 5 discharges um, bar engineering measured flows in the streams uh, the tributaries to the embarrassed river that data was never used in the modeling the modeling for flows was estimated and the flows in the embarrassed river were estimated from gauging data that was from 1942 to 1964. In 1942, there were no mining features in the Embarrassed River watershed, and we can demonstrate that by aerial photos. So many of those tributary streams didn't exist. So trying to, to um, model flows and add a bit of additional flow for the tailings basin, because that was water that was taken out of the Partridge River watershed when tailings were put into the LTV tailings basin, um, isn't scientific. And um, the storage coefficients that were used to model the um, surface aquifer and bedrock aquifer at the tailings basin site um, cannot be found in a range of any scientifically peer-reviewed literature. We find that um, to be flawed science. And in the Partridge River um, we determined using the flow data from the old gauging data, which is somewhat newer than that, what was used in the Embarrassed River, um, that there was additional base flow that, uh, and, and it's something that we brought up continuously because that affects the amount of water that would need to be treated, um, it affects how much when the, the pit begins to refill at polymet, that affects how much water would have to be treated to mix with the polluted water flowing into the pit. And that's part of the mitigation strategies. So we have big questions about whether those mitigation strategies would actually work. And it goes to the heart of financial assurance because if there's more water flowing in, there's more water that needs to be treated. So uh, I, I hope that I sort of answered that in a, in a general way. Thank uh, you. Look, one more question, just one, just one follow-up. So the issue of failure to have peer review and, and all of the, and the quality of the science is one thing, and then I guess just the other thing is, are you concerned that that these flows will, will take the um, contamination up to the boundary waters of BWCA by uh, the Dunk River or any other? No, but I am concerned that that will flow into the St. Louis River and into Lake Superior, the largest freshwater resource in the United States. Representative Phil. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like for the... Uh, Ms. Watkins, to clarify her statement that she's not clear that she's not concerned about the boundary waters and the and the drainage from this uh, of the discharges going uh, into the boundary waters. Exactly where do they go? Do the do the uh, my question would be do the discharges from this go into the boundary waters? Madam Chair, Committee, uh, no, they do they do not flow into the boundary waters. They flow into the Partridge and Embarrassed River sub-watersheds, which flow into the St. Louis River, which flows into Lake Superior. Representative Phil, did you have a follow-up? No, I just, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to make it clear to those and anyone listening that this project really has no effect on the boundary waters whatsoever, and it's a lot of information that suggests that it might by people who aren't in the know. Thank you. 
Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate your making the trip. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, next we have Betsy Daub, Friends of the Boundary Waters. From now on, each of the testifiers will have five minutes, and we will uh, let them know um, how time is going. Uh, I don't intend to cut anybody off in mid sentence, but it does give a clue to wrap up. Madam Chairwoman, uh, members of the committee, my name is Betsy Dobb, and I am the Policy Director with Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness, a nonprofit conservation organization. The PolyMet project raises such significant concerns about the financial risks, in part because of the anticipated long duration of contaminated drainage that will require treatment. And the project's analysis shows a mine that will produce polluted drainage at the mine site and require water treatment at the mine site for a minimum of 200 years and at the plant site for at least 500 years. And these numbers come from PolyMet's own water analysis. In your packets you have, I believe, two graphs that look like this. And I'd like to take a few minutes just to briefly explain those two graphs, walk you through what those are saying and showing. These graphs show water quality expectations for two types of water contamination. On one of the graphs you see the abbreviation CU, that stands for copper, and on the other one the abbreviation SO4, which stands for sulfate. These are just two of several contaminants that PolyMet analyzed in a document called Water Modeling Data Package Volume 1 Mine Site. These graphs show concentrations of these two contaminants in water that has been collected at the mine site and is being sent into the wastewater treatment facility for treatment. This is water that has seeped or drained from mine features like the mine pits or the waste rock piles. You can also see in the title of the graph WWTF, which means wastewater treatment facility and the word influent, which means the water that is being sent into the facility for treatment. This is not measuring or representing the effectiveness of the treatment plant, but assessing the level of water contamination before it is treated. And then at the bottom you see a red dashed line of, at the bottom of the graph, and this is the legal water quality standard, the target that needs to be met. There are three other lines on this graph, and they show three different probability scenarios that were modeled. The P90 level is kind of a worst case probability scenario for the concentration of contaminants, and the P10, the bottom line, is a best case probability scenario, with the P50 level as kind of a mid-range probability. And as you can see, at year 200, the levels of both copper on the one graph and sulfate on the other graph are not anywhere close to meeting the water quality standard dashed line at the bottom of the graph. So this is water that is going to need to be treated or else it will be a source of significant pollution. Copper, for example, at levels above water, the legal water quality standard is extremely toxic to fish and other aquatic life. So we know the proposed PolyMet mine will require at least 200 years of active water treatment at the mine site. And there are similar data for the plant site showing water continuing to need treatment at 500 years. These graphs are not depicting travel times for uncaptured pollution. This is influent into the plant. PolyMet did analyze pollution travel times for uncaptured water, but this is not what is being shown here. And these graphs are also not depicting concentrations of contaminants in the water just sitting in the mine pit lakes. This is seepage and drainage that the mine's collection systems have captured and are sending off to treatment. 200 and 500 years of active water treatment are likely to be very expensive. And yet the PolyMet SDEIS does not describe at all how much this would cost, how it will be paid for, or how Minnesotans will be protected from financial liability. We have heard the DNR say that financial assurance will be worked out in the permitting process, but it is hard to evaluate long-term environmental impacts if we don't know what financial resources will be in hand or how secure those funds will be. 
the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency urged PolyMet four years ago to include financial assurance in the environmental impact statement. But exactly four years later, we have a second EIS that omits this crucial information. While it may be DNR's custom to calculate financial assurance at permitting, there is no legal reason preventing the DNR from doing it in the EIS, and there is every cautionary reason to do so. We believe it is vital that the EIS includes financial assurance disclosures. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions? I don't see any. Thank you. Uh, Paula McAbee, uh, Advocacy Director and Council Water Legacy. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, if I put pages on this, can people see them in the audience? No. All right. I'm Paula McAbee, and I am the Advocacy Director and Counsel for Water Legacy. And Water Legacy is a small grassroots nonprofit formed to protect Minnesota's water resources in the communities that rely on them. And you have in your packet the first page, which quotes from Minnesota Rule 6132-1200 in that financial assurance can cover funds for both for reclamation and for corrective action. But if you read the PolyMet SDEIS, it talks about contingency mitigation measures that are feasible options that could take place um, if compliance with water quality standards is not attained. But the EIS says the contingency mitigation measures would not be initially included in the financial assurance package. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that question one, either it's unanticipated liability, uncertain liability, or contingent liability, is what happens not to the water that is gathered up and put through the reverse osmosis plant process, but what about the other seepage? And first, I have a picture here of, in your packet, of the Anaconda Mine Superfund site. There was a study done, even the projects that predicted in their environmental impact statement that would comply with water quality standards. 89% of the sulfide mine projects actually ended up violating water quality standards. And that's not usually because a treatment plant wasn't funded for long enough, but because pollution seeped into the groundwater, welled up into the surface water, or transported further and contaminated groundwater. And the EPA calculated, and this was all reported in the Federal Register in 2009, that the largest source of Superfund liability in the United States is from hard rock mining of copper and nickel. And that, at the time, they estimated that total as $2.6 billion. And the EPA said that even if there were no other copper nickel mines that run into trouble, the total estimate of taxpayer liability to clean up those mines was someplace between 20 and 54 billion dollars. But I really want to show you, I think the most important documents here, these are maps, um, maps that are taken out of the PolyMet Supplemental Draft EIS. And what this blue illustration, this first one is the PolyMet mine site. And it looks kind of like a peanut and you can see the category one waste rock pile, you can see the different pits, and all this blue drainage. This is what the PolyMet EIS admits is seepage to groundwater. Now, advocates from our group, uh, volunteer expert scientists, tribal scientists, we might disagree on the volume of the uncaptured seepage, the level of contamination of the uncaptured seepage, and even the direction of the flow. But it is an undisputed fact that everybody agrees to, whether it's PolyMet, the advocates, the tribes, the EPA, is that there will be uncaptured seepage. There will be uncaptured seepage at the mine site, and there will be uncaptured seepage at the tailings waste site. This little, uh, looks like a little handprint, is the site of the tailings. And you can't tell from this little map, but the tailings site is approximately 2,900 acres, or four and a half square miles. And so when you talk about seepage from tailings that are being dumped in a facility that size, there's some significance. As you can see, it is acknowledged that there will be seepage. Our only question is how much, how polluted, and how soon. Now this map that's also in your packet of faulted bedrock is not contained in the EIS, 
though we believe it should be. A volunteer geologist came forward after the Duluth hearing and he said, you meant, some people mentioned the question of fractures. Did you know that there were at least 14 faults immediately under the mine site? I said, I had no idea because the EIS denies that there are fractures and that's important because if there are fractures underneath the mine pits and underneath the waste rock piles, then whatever pumps you have, the pollution can go into those fractures and be transported. And this right here, these black lines are fractures that the Minnesota uh, Geological Society has verified. This is not, um, our, our geologist is really just sort of an expert who went and read the maps. So at the mine site, there's a huge potential for dispersal of pollutants through faulted bedrock. At the tailing site, um, one of the issues are volunteer geologists and volunteer hydrogeologists have both looked at is the polymet EIS claims that this huge, huge tailing site, basically thousands of gallons per minute of water, that the total collection from a row of pumps on one end will be 99.38% of the seepage. And what we say is even Mary Poppins, who is practically perfect in every way, would not attain that value of collection. So what we're asking is that in addition to looking at the costs of reverse osmosis, that there should be detailed analysis of contingent risk and the need for corrective action right away in the initial financial assurance. We're also saying that it's important that the agencies look at including joint ventures and parent companies on the permits so that when they come out in year 10 with the elevated number for financial assurance, the company doesn't just go bankrupt and leave the bag. And finally, we would suggest that the legislative committees could have a role in supervising the progress on financial assurance and the progress in permitting to make sure that there is actually protection being provided to the taxpayer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions from members? I don't see any. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Catherine Hoffman, staff attorney for the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. We're going to have Alan Thomas uh, first. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, for the opportunity to testify. My name is Alan Tomac, uh, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. Um, I have 35 years of banking uh, and corporate finance experience, an MBA from the University of Minnesota, and a Chartered Financial Analyst designation. I'm here today to talk about financial assurance, and there are just a few points that I wanted to briefly make. Um, one, what does financial assurance really mean? Two, what is our estimate based on PolyMet's numbers of the amount needed uh, to fulfill their financial assurance obligation? And then some comments about the proposed instruments uh, that may be available uh, to them. Quite simply, uh, financial assurance is setting aside an amount of money at the beginning of operations that's sufficient to meet all of the projected reclamation costs at closure as well as the ongoing water treatment costs. PolyMet's own estimates own estimates anticipate hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in environmental cleanup obligation. The Minnesota Department of Natural Resources uh, um, rarely requires financial assurance for taconite mines, um, and this would be one of the largest financial assurance packages ever for uh, the state of Minnesota. There is an unfortunate history uh, in the pattern. Uh, there is an unfortunate pattern to the history of mining in the U.S. Ore is discovered, uh, mined, depleted over time, and frequently uh, what's left behind is a bankrupt company and an environmental disaster. Uh, LTV is an example of this pattern at the very site that PolyMet now controls. LTV declared bankruptcy and left behind environmental damage with an estimated cleanup cost of over $25 million. A pay-as-you-go plan uh, will not work. Uh, consider, if you will, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, a U.S. government agency uh, that now supports the retirement incomes of about 40 million Americans. These plans were sponsored by companies that failed, plans that the government now has to support. 
Climate did not, uh, despite over 2,200 pages of documents, explicitly quantify the amount needed for financial insurance. We think that's an important number to consider. Um, is it the size of a red box or a barn? Um, so we uh, estimated this number based on the ranges of numbers that they've provided. Their numbers may be conservative, uh, but they state that the cost of the recl reclamation at closure could be uh, as high as $200 million. Ongoing water treatment costs lasting 200 years or more would be another $6 million annually. There are many assumptions about inflation rates, labor rates, equipment costs, uh, rates of return on investments, discount rates that go into these factors. Generally, all of these are very difficult to forecast for three to five years, let alone 200. That said, an amount of $200 million, if invested at 3%, would produce a $6 million cash flow annually. So an estimate of PolyMet's total need to meet its financial, financial assurance obligation uh, in 20 years would be $400 million, $200 million for closure and $200 million for ongoing water treatment. They've not provided for this amount in their capital plan. Um, in the thousands of pages of documents, there's no discussion about this amount or how they intend to fund it, uh, how they intend to fund their financial assurance obligation. Minnesota provides for five different uh, financial instruments to meet the financial assurance requirement. But in our view, not all of those are uh, viable options. Um, we have talked with uh, uh, experts in environmental engineering firms who are familiar with commercial insurance uh, in these matters, and they're saying given the amounts that we're talking about here and the time frames involved, commercial insurance and surety bonds aren't an option. Uh, although a standby letter of credit is mentioned, Letters of credits have fees. If you're paying banks the fees, you're offsetting the beneficial compounding of the earnings of, uh, uh, that uh, could be obtained if these funds were in a trust. Uh, to us, the viable option is really only one. Uh, that's a trust fund um, where the Minnesota DNR would be the beneficiary uh, and uh, uh, earnings would be reinvested uh, and increased over time to meet future obligations. Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, thank you for your attention. Thank you. I don't see any questions. Next is uh, Catherine Hoffman. Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, first I want to thank you for holding this hearing. MCA, the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, which I am here representing, believes that this is an area that is ripe for legislative oversight, and we appreciate your willingness to inquire into this issue. I'm a staff attorney with MCA. I also hold a master's in public policy and environmental policy from the Humphrey Institute. Among my other qualifications, I'm one of the uh, few unfortunate souls in the room who has actually read the 2200-page SDEIS. <laughs> so my first point is that financial assurance should be part of the EIS process. This is so for a few reasons. First, the purpose of an EIS is to evaluate the environmental impacts of a project. This seems self-evident. The PolyMet SDIS concludes that this project has minimal impact on the environment. After 2,200 pages, that's what they conclude. <laughs> it concludes this because it relies on a series of man-made structures to try to capture polluted water before it leaves the site. And, and let's be clear about this. There's no disagreement between PolyMet, the DNR, and organizations like ours that have some concerns about this project about whether this site will produce polluted water. It will. We agree. Likely for hundreds of years. PolyMet proposes to capture all or almost all of the water before it leaves the site. The EIS assumes that this effort is completely successful and therefore there is little impact. And here's where we disagree. MCA does not think it reasonable to assume that all man-made structures work perfectly all the time, and we believe that the SCIS should explore the scenarios under which everything does not function perfectly. DNR's failure to provide adequate financial assurance is one scenario under which 
So telling a strategy to collect and treat water before it leaves the site could fail. How can the DNR in the EIS predict so confidently that it will be able to collect and treat water potentially for hundreds of years without showing that the funds are available to pay for it? It's a critical piece of environmental review. Now, you're hearing this argument from DNR that there's not enough information. It's too early. We, don't, we can't figure out how much financial assurance will cost. This simply isn't true. Polymet has piloted its water treatment technology with specificity. They can even tell you the cost per gallon to treat, get, to treat water. Polymet has designed and provided precise schematics for all of its barriers and collection systems. Those drawings are all available in the public documents, maybe not in the EIS, but in the underlying material. We have a lot of detail about Polymet's mine plan. And you might have picked up on some tension in Mr. Richard's uh, uh, um, testimony on this point. It seems that we have been in uh, environmental review for years, that we have a lot of information about the longevity of these structures, Polymet speaking to the manufacturers. We have a lot of detail about what they're proposing, just not quite enough for financial assurance. Of course, it's true that the mine plan could change. But that's true of everything in the EIS, including all of the environmental impacts. That's not a reason not to make some calculations based on the information we have today. I'll tell you what, though. There's an easy way to test this argument. Simply require PolyMet to show its work. It has projections. They're in the EIS. They're printed verbatim in the EIS from PolyMet's consultants. DNR has accepted these numbers. They've never asked PolyMet to prove that these numbers are reasonable or based on acceptable assumptions. Ask the DNR to get these assumptions, these calculations from PolyMet, which it should do anyway because it published those numbers in the EIS. And then we can decide for ourselves whether PolyMet's calculations are premature or not. But they're out there and we should be asking for them. Now, you'll be hearing later about how financial assurance has come a long way. Modern financial assurance packages are adequate. MCA does not disagree. It is theoretically possible, and it probably has been done in some examples, although most of those mines are so new that that hasn't really been tested. But simply because it can be done does not mean that it will be done correctly in this case, and sunlight is the best disinfectant. The sooner we know what DNR intends, the better the analysis will be. It belongs in the EIS. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you again. I have, uh, I have a question uh, about, um, we talk about this collection of water, we talk about seepage. Um, how can you collect all the water going straight down in a pit, in a pit? I mean, how is that possible? Well, there's, there's two um, structures on the site that are unlined, and in that case, it is not possible. One of them is the mine pit. Uh, the mine pit, a portion of it will be backfilled with all of the waste rock, um, some of it quite reactive, some of it less reactive. Um, and then there's a mine pit that will be an open lake. And those aren't lined. Um, they will be in contact with the surficial aquifer. They'll be in contact with the groundwater. And there's really nothing that uh, anybody can do to prevent that from happening. All that PolyMet proposes to do is to pump water out of the west pit to try to prevent that lake from overflowing. But it doesn't do anything with the groundwater. Um, the second structure that has no lining is the tailings basin. Uh, the tailings basin, as we know, is a brownfield site that was previously owned by LTV. It predates the Clean Water Act. It predates modern environmental laws. It leaks about 2,000 gallons per minute. Now, Polymet is proposing to build a barrier down to the bedrock around that tailings basin uh, to collect the surface seepage, which is some portion of that 2,000 gallons per minute. But some portion of it is going into the bedrock and it's going through uh, fractures in the bedrock. Uh, that, though that leakage cannot be uh, collected. Um, I want to make one comment about the barrier around the tailings basin as well. Um, that structure needs to be keyed into the bedrock, meaning that polymet needs to actually dig into the bedrock. Otherwise, all you're going to get is water sliding under that barrier out 
between the bedrock and the barrier, it's not going to work. Um, and that's actually not and clear that they're proposing that from the uh, schematics that we've seen so far. So that's a detail that um, we probably need to know more about. So for the, in both of the pits that are online, they just have linings around the sides. Um, is there any, just in terms of, we're looking at financial assurance here, we're looking at, we have to pay to clean up what's going through. Um, is there any measure or standard of how much is okay to go through the ground? But down and out. Madam Chair, um, it's entirely dependent on the site itself. Um, there's a couple sets of laws at issue here. One would be the groundwater quality standards, um, which would apply uh, directly to whatever seeps out of these, uh, the mine pit and the tailings basin. Um, we also have surface water standards. Uh, there, are, there's a, the Partridge River wraps around the mine site. It's quite close to the mine. Uh, the Embarrass River is fairly close to the tailings basin um, and is already affected by the tailings basin as it exists today. Um, and those the way that the Clean Water Act is written is that discharges from the mine site and the tailings basin cannot cause or contribute to exceedances of the uh, surface water standards. Exceedances is a funny word. People hear that and they think we mean that the water is better than it should be, but an exceedance is actually the legal term for violation. So it cannot cause or contribute to a violation. Um, so in this case, the question is how much water is seeping out of the mine pit and the tailings basin, and is it enough, and is it carry sufficient pollutants to cause violations of Clean Water Act standards in these nearby rivers. Um, you know, PolyMet contends no, it does not. But again, they're assuming that all of their structures uh, work perfectly. So our concern is the scenario under which some of these structures do not uh, are not do not perform as well as proposed. Um, and in that scenario, you may see uh, water quality standard violations in the nearby rivers uh, much sooner um, and in at higher levels than polymath predicts. So that is where we have to estimate a what really is should be in a contingency fund how much and that's the kind of the missing piece as I see this at this point. Uh, we have the reclamation piece, we have if something in the permit is violated piece, but we do not have this piece. Am I reading that right? Madam Chair, that's correct. Um, the EIS does not explore the scenario under which uh, these collection systems don't function as well as predicted. Um, and DNR has been quite clear at this point that that scenario also will not be included in financial assurance. So if we do have a wastewater treatment plant breakdown, um, the, one of the pipeline breaks, uh, the tailings basin dam failures, which is the number one cause of mining pollution worldwide, um, any of these things happen, that's, there will not be funds for that in the financial assurance package. Um, but if, Madam Chair and committee members, look no further than West Virginia, where recently we saw a tank with uh, extremely tox toxic chemicals right next to a water body first and the very next day that company declared bankruptcy. They didn't wait to find out how much the liability would be. They didn't wait for the lawsuits. They declared bankruptcy and they walked away. So, um, you know, we believe that it is naive to assume that the only potential costs that the state could be on the hook for are the costs of reclamation and closure. Accidents can also cause sudden problems that, that may cause a site to close down or a company to walk away. Well, if something is going through the bottom, it's not an accident. It's just that's so it does seem to me that that is a piece of the puzzle that is missing here. That's no accident. We've, we've designed it without a liner, or that's Polymet seems to have designed both of these pits without liners. I mean, we require liners for. Um, Landfills, new ones, old ones didn't have them. We learned better. We required for new ones. When we redid the Washington County landfill, we required a triple liner. Any other questions for members? Thank you.
Scott Strand. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on this uh, very important topic. Uh, my name is Scott Strand, S-T-R-A-N-D. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. MCA is a public interest organization that uses law and science to protect Minnesota's environment, and we have been involved in the non-ferrous mining topic um, for literally decades now. Um, financial insurance is a critical issue. I commend the committee for taking it on. I think this is a perfect subject for rather tough legislative oversight because the, the, the costs of making a mistake are high. So I, again, I commend the committee for taking this issue on. I just want to finish up our testimony by articulating uh, what I consider to be five key principles for doing the financial assurance work at the DNR. Um, five principles, and I think that'll help um, you know, move this to a situation where we can uh, we can resolve a number of these issues. Um, number one's already been discussed. Uh, address financial assurance in the environmental review process in the EIS. If the agencies know enough about the wastewater treatment plants, the hydraulic barriers, the groundwater pumps, all of the man-made structures, um, they know enough about those things to tell us that water quality is going to be protected, then they know enough about them or ought to know enough about them to estimate the cost and how much money has to be set aside to maintain them. Principle number two, use objective outside indexes to set the key figures needed to, cal to calculate financial assurance. Discount rates, expected rates of investment return, inflation adjustments, equipment and labor costs. These are all should be determined by, by looking at outside indicators, objective indicators that are out there. These should not be the topic of negotiations. Principle number three, respect Murphy's Law. Um, include the cost of remediating reasonably, po reasonably possible accidents or contingencies and do it up front. It's very hard to buy homeowner's insurance when your house is burning down. When an accident occurs, it's not the time to seek additional financial assurance. What needs to be done is to give a reasonable estimate of the probability of these accidents occurring and make the appropriate assessments so that the financial assurance covers that, just like any insurer would do. Number four, don't rely on third-party guarantees. Um, Mr. Tomitz explained that uh, the market for things like letters of credit, surety bonds, insurance policies to cover this kind of liability is extremely limited now. Trust fund is probably the way that we're going to have to go. Um, but I think there's another element, and that's the legal element. Um, Third-party guarantees typically are not free from the reach of the bankruptcy court. More and more bankruptcy courts are using their broad injunction authority to take payments from non-debtors, in other words, guarantees from insurance companies, from banks, and from other sureties. They pay their money into the, into the bankruptcy estate, and then they get a release from all liability from the bankruptcy court. Um, that's ex then that money that goes into that bankruptcy estate gets distributed according to the rules of the bankruptcy court. It's not available to somebody like the state of Minnesota anymore. That's happening more and more in the bankruptcy courts. It's a real risk. I'm not saying they can't be used to supplement, say, a trust fund arrangement. I think that's a sound idea. But we can't rely on those third-party guarantees in order to meet the requirements of the rules. And then finally, number five, um, and I think this is really the overarching principle, the risk of uncertainty, the risk of uncertainty has to be placed on the company, not on the taxpayers. Um, all of the testimony today is, should have made it quite clear that there's a lot that we don't know. Um, that's going to continue. There are going to be a lot of things that we're not going to know. But it is not fair to the taxpayers or the environment for them to take on the risk of getting it wrong. The risk of getting it wrong has to be on the company, and that should be a principle that, that informs all of the DNR's calculations in this area. Those are the five principles. Uh, there is no such thing as a risk-free mine. We all know that. But the DNR follows some of these principles. Uh, Minnesota's taxpayers in our environment have a better chance of being fairly protected. Thank you, Madam Chair. Stand for any questions.